she's done two successful games. So the third game, you'd expect her to be getting like, you know, a, you know, at least a livable wage for a year, right? You'd expect at least the game has done ridiculously well. Like, I'm sure it's if it's not 450 million, it's going to be in the hundreds of millions. A voice actor who has gone to school, practice, been in the booth built up uh, a credibility and a reputation mm. who the fans have responded well to mm. um you know that is that is a professional they work across all spectrum of games they'll do tiny little indie things and they'll also work away at the tr- big triple a things and here's the thing like they're a huge yeah. huge part of the reason why any game is successful like you literally can't have a the most prolific mistake um in terms of voice acting that i'm aware of is games industry if you're listening Sort it out, yeah? Pay pay voice actors, give them subsidiaries whenever po- royalties, wherever possible. Sonic is more than uh what? Hoo-hoo. What? Um, <laughs> you shouldn't have to be just scrolling through your YouTube recommended list and see a big old thumbnail that spoils everything, you know. Yeah. It's... Yeah, it's a real shame. It's a real shame. And we were talking on the pre show about I have forgotten my sling. I think you should have a side hustle as a voice actor. Oh. I'll put that in the uh, I'll put that in the intro. I have forgotten my sling. <laughs> Hello there. Welcome to the Polygon Forest podcast. Uh, my name is Chris Jarvis. I'm an indie game dev and I am joined by Sam Webster, the uh, indie game dev also. Thank you Sam for joining yeah. us. Uh, hey, no worries. It's good to be back. I uh, I continue to be your substitute teacher while Vinny is away. Yeah, Vin Hill, um, Ubisoft concept artist and indie game dev, is um, he's still busy. Um, got lots and lots planned, which he'll be hopefully talking about soon. And Sam has been very gracious filling in for Vin. Uh, Sam usually joins us once a month for the indie game dev roundtable that we do alongside this news video game podcast. Um, and we are overdue for an update with our indie games. So if you like indie game development, then check check out that podcast. Um, but in this week's episode, what we're going to be talking about is the Bayonetta voice actress, Helena Taylor, and the inf- up-to-date information that's been happening, because it's been an ongoing story for a few weeks that we just didn't talk about last week uh, for no particular reason. Um, so we're going to clear up the money uh, and get our thoughts on that. We're going to talk about the God of War Ragnarok spoilers. Unfortunately, there's been some news uh, regarding spoilers there. And uh, just to be clear, we will not be sharing oh. the spoilers. We're just yes. talking about the fact that there are spoilers yeah. and that that is in itself shitty. Yes, we we yeah. will not talk about Ragnarok spoilers for probably you know a good six months, I'd imagine. Um, so Steam. Uh, has got over 30 million concurrent players and it's a new record been set so we can discuss what's gone into that and what that means for the wider uh video game industry and business yeah Uh, are our habits changing yeah exactly um but first um sam how have you been what you've been up to are you doing well uh yeah yeah great um had obviously i mentioned richie listening in the car last week uh he's been over this weekend he visited stayed over a couple of nights and apparently that did freak him out while he was listening in the car oh, really? um but that was great we um went game hunting in bristol ate some good food uh chatted about uh life in the universe and uh yeah played a, a lot a lot of arcade games which was uh yeah I think I'm due an arcade. Uh, I, th- I feel like it's been a long time since I've, I've played any arcade games. Although I've got an arcade game mm. machine upstairs that I could play some Pac-Man on and some um, Space Invaders and stuff. But And Gallagher. I just need to get around to it. Um, okay. Yeah. And I've been not really doing much game stuff. Oh, yeah. I have been doing a bit of indie game stuff, actually. I've worked out this mechanic that I was really struggling with. I literally mm. cannot explain it. I tried to put it in words the other day. And the best thing I can do is just show what I was working on, which is on my Twitter. Um, so, if yeah, check out my Twitter, Acrylic Pixel, uh, if you wanted to see what I've been working on. But first, let's talk about Bayonetta. So, Sam, have you you've been up to date with this? Um, the voice actor Helena Taylor, all her 
uh, videos that she's posted on Twitter. She's basically um, rebuked any non-disclosure agreement that she had um, with the manufacturers of Bayonetta. Who makes Bayonetta anyway? It's Platinum Games that are developer and Nintendo Publishing. Right. Perfect. Yep. Um, so yes, she has gone on record and made some videos, posted it on Twitter, go check that out, about how little she's been paid for uh, Bayonetta 1 and 2. And she, of course, wasn't the voice actor on Bayonetta 3. And now that Bayonetta 3 has been released, she has gone on record to sort of, um, you know, do the war cry of um, voice actors getting underpaid for massively successful uh, game franchises. Um, so what are your initial thoughts on this, Sam? Have you been up to date with it? Yeah, I've been following this one. So obviously as a creative, um, it's pay is something that's always on our minds, pay and conditions, um, yeah. because a lot of creative work uh isn't that secure yeah. um and a lot of people do end up doing it more out of the passion than anything else and i think that gets uh both abused and taken advantage of um which is sad um mm. initially she came out of course and she said that she had been offered a flat four thousand us dollars to do uh the whole game yeah and that was was shockingly low mm. uh, with the cost of living in the UK at the moment. You know, the average rent and everything else maybe lasts for a month and a bit. Yeah. 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 And that might be her only gig for, you no know, six months or so. Yeah. Um, so that is, yeah, really poor. And what she was asking for was for a respectable living wage. And mm. she's saying, look, I can't even put petrol in my car. Uh, for Americans, that's what we call gas. Um, it's just, it's nuts, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Originally she was said that it was like 4,000. We now know what the actual figures were. But for me, the major headline is that all the numbers we're going to talk about in a minute and clear up any confusion for anyone, it's still ridiculously low for mm. such a huge uh, games franchise, which she claims is worth $450 million dollars. So she's a huge integral part of that. And, you know, she's done two successful games. So the third game, you'd expect her to be getting like, you know, a, you know, at least a livable wage for a year, right? You'd expect at least something. Well, it shouldn't even be, shouldn't even be that you get to game free to get a living wage. You know, you can go to, if you want minimum wage, which is essentially what she was offered, you can go do that at bloody Tesco, just scanning on the checkouts, you know. Yeah. A, a voice actor who has gone to school, practice, been in the booth, built up uh, a credibility and a reputation mm. who the fans have responded well to, mm. um, you know, that is that is a professional, and that deserves professional levels of compensation. Yeah. And even the, the new figures, um, to potentially jump ahead a bit, um, her number of $4,000 got disputed. Um, there were people saying that uh, she was asking for six figures and supposedly some anonymous sources corroborating that to various news sites. Um, she has clapped back, uh, refuting that, and saying the original offer was 10000 mm -hmm. She wrote to Hideki Kamiya, um, who then said... Okay, I'll add an extra five, which would have made it fifteen thousand USD, mm -hmm. uh, which still is only about what with current exchange rates, maybe thirteen GBP UK where she's based, mm. which still is not, you know, it's not great. Um, it's maybe four months' money, yeah, give or take, uh, and that's again basing on you know, not not huge sums of earnings, mm. um, and then she said no to that. Noted a 15,000. 11 months later, according to Helena, they came back to her and that's when they made the offer for a flat 4,000. So the 4,000 was the most recent figure. Yeah. There had been a 15,000 11 months prior to that, yeah. but that had effectively been taken off the table. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's not untrue to say that she was offered 4,000 in total for the gig. 
It's just that prior to the 11 months with no contact, she was offered more, which again, yep. doesn't make any sense. It's like, oh, you've, we've not heard anything for 11 months. So therefore let's reduce what we were going to offer. What? And the thing is, it's like, you know, the thing that gets me is that she's at the top of a game. Like what you said, she's a professional. She's like mm. one of the best voice actors around and her voice lends herself so well to the character of Bayonetta. Um, yep. It's totally and utterly um, like intrinsic to the character and it brings so much of the game out and, and people respond well to it. And it, the, the game has done ridiculously well. Like I'm sure it's, if it's not 450 million, it's going to be in the hundreds of millions of the, the games could have have made yeah. um i think it's just ridiculous and so since since then there's been other people that have come out of the um out on twitter to say what they've been making and oh yeah so okay uh, sean chiplock said that they I, were paid oh sorry were you gonna say something i shouldn't be nosy uh, yeah. it should be none of my business but you have my attention okay <laughs> they said <laughs> Uh, they got approximately two to three thousand overall because uh, it's based on the total number of hours in the studio, which was higher because of voicing three actors in a single game. So I made more from voicing Spade and Dale in Freedom Planet One because that generously gave me sales royalties. So if someone's done three f- three voices and got two to three thousand pounds for doing three characters. Um, so this is just teeny tiny money. And what we're talking about is the, where the America, they've got the, um, the SAG. Uh, uh, union, SAG-AFTRA. SAG-AFTRA, which is basically yeah. like union jobs. So it's like the voice actors um, union, which has like a minimum amount of money that you can be paid for a gig. And yeah, unfortunately it is like hourly. So even though your voice, you're doing, you know, a few hours work, it ends up being only a few thousand dollars. Obviously you can't live like that. If you're only getting a few no. gigs a month, if you're only getting a few gigs, like you, you, you'd have to be working a lot. Like you'd have to be getting gigs lined up one after the other. I, I don't sort of... know. I don't know the full details on SAG-AFTRA, but as you say, it is, um, I think it's a minimum of three hours. So even if you don't do three hours in the booth, you get you paid, get paid for three hours. Yep. And it's between 900 and $1,000. Uh, for the minimum amount of work so right yeah and, and in terms do... of a rate sorry a rate of out so it's an hourly rate so nine thousand nine hundred to a thousand dollars an hour as a rate but if you're only going to be working a few hours it's not wait that's wait. i don't think that's oh, right oh sorry I think no they're... one day one day yeah. one day has a going rate between nine hundred and one thousand okay I was going to say that sounded high. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that sounded very high. An hour. That's pretty good an hour. So, I'm, yeah, apologies. So, yeah, then we've had other people coming out and comparing it. And, and you know, there's a huge difference between, like, uh, and um, uh, Helena also says about uh, voicing, like, uh, minor characters in, like, a fighting mm. game. And it's just, uh, 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 okay, great job. Biff, yeah. baff, bosh. Um you know, and then getting paid similar sort of money to what, to what she was offered for Bayonetta. Um, and it's like once she's like a secondary character in a fighting game that's, I can't even remember what the name of it was. And then one's one of the most recognizable video game characters uh, that ever existed, arguably. So we've had this this stuff with Helena um, and the sag after stuff sort of came to my attention as of a, a separate voice actor dispute. Hmm. So I don't know if you watch anime at all. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. So one of the more popular animes at the moment is Mob Psycho 100. And the lead character in that mob uh, has been voiced by Mike McCarley, uh, Kyle McCarley, uh, up until now. Uh, so Kyle has not been on a SAG-AFTRA contract. He's been on uh, worse terms than a SAG-AFTRA contract, because Crunchyroll, uh, who are pretty much the anime dubbing monopoly since they merged with Funimation, um, just just don't do it. So he said he would come back for season three of Mob Psycho 100 yeah. on the condition that Crunchyroll sits down and has a conversation with SAG-AFTRA. 
And that's not a guarantee of moving to sag after a contract. It's not a guarantee of recognizing that union. Yeah. You know, there's, there's no guarantee of change. There. Just sit down at the table with them and have a chat. That's what he asked for. Yeah. As a result, Crunchyroll are replacing Carl McCarley uh, as Mob. So they're replacing the voice of the main character because the voice actor, Dad asked them to just sit down with the union. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we, even in the UK, we've got we've got similar problems. So um, with Rockstar, back in 2008, the voice mm. actor that played Nico Bellic, uh, Michael Hollick, he was apparently paid around $100,000 for 15 months work. So in comparison, that's like night and day. But he even mm. at the time wasn't very happy back then. And his quote was, it's tough. When you see Grand Theft Auto 4 uh, out and it's the biggest thing right now, when they're making hundreds of millions of dollars and we don't see any of it. Yeah. Uh, effectively, it's whenever you get this BS from anyone about trickle-down economics, bullshit. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's the proof right there. There's no no residuals, no royalties, no no nothing. Trickling down to who? Exactly. Yeah. Um, Troy Baker has voiced his opinion on the $100,000 being being quoted. And he said that's mm. a significant amount of money for a single role. So Troy Baker, who's uh, Joel on The Last of Us. So again, probably one of the most most recent uh, oh, yeah. big, you know, he probably got f- for, although he had a minor role in um, the most recent game without any spoilers. Um <laughs> and also when before the last of us one became massive it was a nothing so yeah. again with his he might not have got paid a lot for for the last of us one even though it was the lead role on triple a game but even when even when he was coming into the last of us one right one it's naughty dog who were pretty much playstation's right hand man in terms of first party developers yeah. they lean heavily on them they give them massive budgets they let them make these show-stopping games to yeah. really show off what their hardware can do. Yeah. Uh, so it was high profile. And Troy Baker, even going back, what's it been, 10 years since part one came out on PS3? Yeah. So even then, he was very high profile. I mean, anyone listening to this podcast who's played a game in the last 15 years, probably 60, 70% of those games had Troy Baker in doing at least one role. Yeah. Um the guys in the guys in everything, you don't get much bigger than Troy Baker when it comes to voice acting VAs. Yeah. And even he's like, Yeah, I I, I have months where I live paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. And he's on he's he's notoriously no he's known for being the guy who's in all the video games. Like he's he's probably one of the most credited video game actors out there. He's got He's got his name on so, so many games. Um, so he's like at the top of his game as well. And people like Laura Bailey. And so it's, diff- it's difficult because, yeah. right. Well, so Troy Baker, Nolan North. Like, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The top echelons of voice actors. Yeah. They, they work They work across all spectrum of games. So they'll do tiny little indie things. And they'll also work away at the tr- big AAA things. And here's the thing. Like all, when, it, when you're making a game, especially third, like Naughty Dog, there was no guarantee that, when The Last of Us came out, that it was going to be big. So there are studios that are smaller, and then they make big games and they're big. The problem is that if you have a union that suddenly turns around and says, okay, you need to pay royalties for all your voice actors because that's fair, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the smaller AAA games that don't make much money, that are a bit, not flops, but just don't sell gangbusters, right? Um, And so the residuals might be pennies. Um. But again, that's I can't see why they can't do that. Even if it's pennies, you're still still building. The more work you do, the more pennies you're going into your part, and the more you know it. It's more of an incentive to do more jobs, right? If you if your residuals well, stack up, exactly that. If I help this game be a success, I will be financially rewarded. Um, you're going to put in more effort compared to, well, whether the game does well or the game does shit. 
I've been paid. Yeah. Um, that's a significantly less investment, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. Um, at, when, when they get like super runaway successes, then the voice actors mm. should benefit from that because they're a huge, yeah. huge part of the reason why any game is successful. Like you literally can't have a bad voice actor and a massively successful video game. It's kind of impossible. I mean, you could have people that say they, they weren't blown away by certain voice acting, but you can't mm. have like mistakes or things that don't fit with the world. Like you could have bad lines or corny lines, but but again, like you can't have a voice actor that doesn't know their stuff and have a you know, great successful video game. It's like one of those linchpins of success. Like it needs it needs a certain level of quality. The most prolific mistake um, in terms of voice acting that I'm aware of is um, that game where someone, I think it's one of the Elder Scrolls games, but they flub their line and they go, let me take that again. And then they start the line again. Yeah. And that's that's an editing issue. Yeah. It's just someone hasn't cut hasn't edited the front it. part of the audio. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But there is, I think there's a general disrespect and disregard for uh, voice actors for anime video games anything where they're not um a face mm. and i would point largely to uh both the sonic and mario movies so obviously sonic they went ahead and got ben schwartz to do sonic whereas we've had um no oh, game well they got the voice actor for tales from the games for the movie mm-hmm. but that's the only person who carried across yeah and likewise Mario, they didn't get Charles Martinet, they got Chris Pratt. Yeah. And how much are they paying Chris Pratt to do this 90-minute movie? Or however long it is. Yeah. I'm just throw 90 minutes Because out. he's a Hollywood actor, he gets all the big bucks. But but people that sowed their oats in the voice acting community, they get pushed to the sidelines and don't get as much respect. Yeah. Yeah, Charles Martinet, who's been the voice of Mario for... <sighs> Decades. Since the 90s, yeah. basically. Since the mid-90s. Yeah. Um... You know, coming on thirty years, the one bit probably doesn't get ten percent. Yeah, what Chris Pratt is getting for the one movie. Yeah, but his entire you know twenty year run as a character. The one thing I will say about Charles is that I can understand the conversation that goes something like this, and this is probably the best version of this, and it probably didn't happen like this. It's like, could parents be turned away if they think that Charles is going to be talking for ninety minutes? And there's a reason why there hasn't been more than a few catchphrases since the 90s that Mario has done, especially like in the animation, the early, like the 90s animation of like Mario and Luigi. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, the Super Mario Bros. Super Show. That's that it. was... Um, there's to- the accent's toned Lou, down. Lou something. Yeah, but the accent's not yeah. as in your face. So I can understand that. And also... Yeah, Chris Pratt didn't do a very good job. That's been all the headlines. But this is a video game podcast, not a movie podcast. But it ties in with the video game, doesn't it? It does. It yeah. absolutely ties in. Yeah. And um, uh, I don't know. It's just... What's it to do? <laughs> but, like, Roger Craig Smith has been Sonic now for 10 years. Wow. Uh, and Sonic is more than... Uh, what? Hoo-hoo! Yeah! That's true. It's yeah. a me, Mario. That's actually pretty You know, the good. Sonic... <laughs> Thank you. What? Um... <laughs> yeah, right. But Sonic has had, like, shonen anime style, big plot lines with proper voice acting and that for... Since the Dreamcast era, really. And Roger Craig Smith has... He's like the third voice actor now, but yeah. he's been in that role for... Yeah, I'd say about 10 years, easy. Yeah. Um, Sonic fans are going to correct me in the comments, it's fine. But I don't think he was even in the discussion for the Sonic movie. I don't think he was even That's considered. But Ben did a good... I like Ben Schwartz. I think he did a good job for the character. He knew he knew the soul of Sonic, at least. So he did a good job. He did. Um, I'm just not sure that they needed to... They didn't need to. They had someone who could do the job right there and then. Yes, agreed, agreed. Totally. And it was a let's get some adults through the door thing. Yeah, and and then when they got um, Tails' VA for the movie from the games, mm. Colleen... Uh, I I can't even spell her surname, let alone pronounce it. It's mm. Sh- Shahanasi, or... It's, 
yeah. maybe that's why they, when they're doing the press tour <laughs> oh no she's in well, the film uh, right yeah I don't know. yeah yeah so Colleen O'Shana Hesse, however it's pronounced, reprised her game role as Tails for the movie. Mm. But when they first did the poster for the movie, she wasn't on it. Mm -hmm. Her name was not on the poster at all. It was only because fans kicked off on Twitter Mm. that they redid the poster and added her name. And it's like, again, you will put Ben's name on there because he's Hollywood comedian actor, Mm. but the the woman who has been voicing this character for again a decade plus hmm. doesn't um, get a mention yeah yeah it's a tough one yeah what can you do so games industry if you're listening sort it out yeah pay pay voice actors give them subsidiaries whenever po- royalties wherever possible um i will add one other thing mm-hmm. so we have had hollywood actors cross over into voicing games yes because it a name on the box and they can sell copies right yeah um we even had that there's that time loop game top down view they had daisy ridley and uh what's his face 15 minutes that might well be the one someone breaks in and yeah yeah william Um, william defoe and um the scottish actor i can't remember his name yeah scottish maybe ewan mcgregor no no Uh, he plays um professor x in the earlier x-men ones james mcavoy that's it Oh, okay, James McAvoy, right. Fair enough. But they got them in and they didn't realise that they sound terrible. Uh, Because acting on camera and voice acting, they're two different disciplines. Yeah. They're not the same thing. So you're you're paying more for these Hollywood names and getting less. That aren't used to being in the booth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. There was a talk about that on Player Watch. Listen, my take on that specific game is that that could well be a factor that those actors especially daisy ridley who uh was is younger hasn't had the booth time to and you know and it sounded like it was just like a one or two day voice recording session um so there might have been a learning curve there it was from a new studio i believe and obviously that this has never happened before like getting hollywood actors in you know three Hollywood actors in ensemble cast on like a very vocal driven game. It's like a lot of it's based, a lot of the emotion comes from what they're saying. And it's a, like a time loop game where they got to hear the same stuff again and choose click buttons and then get reactions. There's lots going on where there, where, where it could be that they did an amazing job in certain circumstances were less than ideal. That's totally and utterly believable like so it's it's the water's muddied in my opinion on that game like there's no real way to tell what happened so yeah yeah i don't think that's the sole example um it's been there's probably more for sure yeah um i just in general they seem to be willing to pay 10 times more for a face and then they get them in the booth and realize oh yeah they need the voice uh yeah so the be- the best way to do it then, best of both worlds, is to get the Hollywood actors for the bit parts that just have like a few lines, and then you've still got <laughs> the Hollywood actors in the film that you can like market the heck out of, and then you get like you know the solid voice actors that know their chops. Probably on the or we just start appreciating, the or we just start appreciating their craft. Mm. There are the people like Mark Hamill that that crossed the, the boundaries, you know. Oh yeah. So yeah. that's a bit I think of an Mark Hamill is is exceptional. Yes. Yes, he is. He's yeah. one of a kind. There's no one like him for sure. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we should probably we should probably move on to the next uh the next point yeah. then. Uh. So yeah, God of War Ragnarok. It's out very soon. Doesn't really matter saying about it because most people aren't going to watch this uh, podcast. It's the ninth. The ninth. It's out. Ninth of November. Ninth of and November. We're, as of recording, it's the thirtieth of October. Right. Um, Just to break the magic and and pull the curtain back. Yeah. It's not happening yeah. now. Um. There's been a retailer. I couldn't find the retailer, but uh, maybe there's a good reason why we couldn't find the retailer. Car- Corey Barlog has gone on Twitter and it's been reported in the news as well that there's been video of um, God of War Ragnarok spoilers um, it's plastered around the internet. So don't. So we're all got to kind of step away from Twitter and the internet for a while. 
I guess, to hide away from these God of War Ragnarok spoilers. Yeah, so there's a couple of things to, to dig into here. One is, uh, so a retailer, which has not, to my knowledge, been named, uh, has broken street date by about two weeks, which means people have the game in their hands now. And they're playing it, um, I guess. They'll be playing it like there's no tomorrow. And they'll be one of the only few people in the whole world that yeah. have played this game when they shouldn't have. <laughs> Yeah, so because of that, we do now have uh, subreddits and YouTube videos and all sorts uh, full of story spoilers, which is great. And Corey Barlog, um, who, you know, obviously it's his baby, essentially. It's just like, for Pete's sake, I can't, you know, again? Because this is a, a recurring theme in the industry at the moment where uh, Nintendo don't seem to be able to release a game without it leaking like a week before. Yeah, you know, seems to happen with everything that's coming to the Switch. It leaks a week beforehand. Yeah, God of War two weeks ahead of time. That's a big and, one. Two weeks is huge, really. Right, and yeah. and even Corey himself says, legitimate customers and players should not have to do the song and dance. They shouldn't have to, you know, mute words on Twitter. Or come offline for two weeks or or whatever. Yeah. You shouldn't have to be just scrolling through your YouTube recommended list and see a big old thumbnail that spoils everything. You know? Yeah. It's... Yeah, it's a real shame. It's a real shame. And we were talking on the pre-show about how it never used to be this way. Like, uh, what was that Twitter <laughs> comment where you, you could go and watch The Sixth Sense and there would be big twists in the film and, and the film would be out for ages and everyone would just go, yeah. oh, I love that film. It was great. You should go and watch it. And no one would say, oh, there's a big twist at the end. Or anything. It, was, um, it was on Eurogamer's article in the comments there and it said uh, Sixth Sense and Fight Club. Yeah. Um, like and if Seven they came out well. today. And Seven, right. yeah. But if they came out today, there's no way you would get to just experience that twist nicely for yourself in the cinema. No. And the reply to it I absolutely loved was just, back in my day, children had to walk barefoot for six miles in the snow to have a game spoiled. <laughs> it's just like, but yeah, it's true. It's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember when, um, even when The Last of Us 1 came out, like, and there was still, you know, there was a buzz about it. And, um, you know, it's, it's spoilers still weren't, like, a huge thing it wasn't like although was it a spoil worthy game or it was just kind of like more of an experience game wasn't it it wasn't like oh the thing that happened at the end although i don't know yeah the last of us did have that moment but mm. it felt i don't know if that's a good excuse or a good um i don't know if that's a good one to use as like a potential spoiler See, game the last of us part two we we can use that so was actually pre-release because they had the scripts and stuff leaked yeah, for that. That's and that true. was early, early. Yeah. And I was just scrolling Twitter one day. Bearing in mind, I have never finished The Last of Us Part 1. It's one of those games I just can't get on with for really? whatever reason. Just, Interesting. Yeah, I've tried a couple of times, never sticks. Hmm. But I was scrolling through Twitter, um, just normally, and someone had written, I am not going to buy The Last of Us 2 because... Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. The spoiler, thing that spoiler. happens. Uh, it's just like, cheers for that. <laughs> wow. People... I hope you feel better. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. I think it's this thing with social media and kids. Kids today and shaking my stick. Like, you know, get Old off man my yells at cloud. <laughs> but it, it, it is true. Like, kids that might not have friends that play video games. So their community might be international. It might be online. You know, they, they don't see that... Um, time of like human interaction between when you say something and when you receive something so there's that mm. time so they're just they're just typing into the void or they're or even recording a video and sending it off yeah. into the void and then they're just th what they're getting isn't a human face where you get instant oh. empathy they're getting they're getting um you know serotonin blasts because they're getting like comments or uh yeah. videos oh, or it, things that it are gets like, a make them feel good because yeah. they're not seeing that anger they're not seeing the upset that they're causing be because there's that wall of separation from like a human conversation that we forget to have sometimes 
it's this weird thing that I've noticed in gaming in general. I'm going to use Sonic Frontiers because Sonic is unsurprisingly my go-to. Frontiers is out the day before God of War, which is, um, so got, I'm going to say, unfortunate. You've got one day to play it before <laughs> you need to move on. I, I've booked the day off work. Oh, great. And, and I've seen two two sides of the Sonic fan base on this one. So, on the one hand, there have been people who are like, look, I've decided I'm buying the game, I've got my pre-order in, I am now, I'm not even going to watch the official trailers at this point. I'm yeah. just going to enjoy the ride. Yeah. And, and they've muted the words on Twitter and they've done this, that, the other, just to, to try and avoid spoilers. And then there is this crowd that seems to be almost actively seeking the spoilers out and any shred of information they can get like they seem to be enjoying the hunt yeah yeah and like every time they find out even the tiniest detail they're like a victory that's interesting is it like something to achieve like the unobtainable Mm. so it's like an actual achievement if you get it because it's difficult and you have an interest in it is that what's going on with these people it's something that's totally foreign to me it's something it's something i've never wanted to experience um, i don't understand it i'm in the camp of you know i've got my pre-order in i know i'm going to buy it and play it anyway so yeah there but um so certainly i'm watching this behavior from the outside mm. and while it's alien to me they do seem to be having fun mm. they're like oh we know something we're not supposed to know and yeah. that's that makes us feel whatever it is that they feel um and that seems and it gives them a community to talk to and it gives them this that the other and i'm like that's fine and if that's how you get your jollies more power to you Mm -hmm. if if that's how you get your jollies jesus um anyway but can you try and keep that contained because like it keeps leaking out to those of us that don't want to know yeah that's the point these social media platforms aren't aren't perfect by any uh, you know nowhere near perfect Mm. and so yeah information can get to people that they don't want to see it's a tricky one it's a tricky one what's the what's the what's the best way is it that people should just be like yeah this is it to be more mindful people could be upset by this information that i have i should probably keep it to myself and be a good like neighbor to the world and not let them know i wanted to go on my journey of discovery but i'm quite happy keeping that information to myself or is is it a look at me look what i did i got this information ha 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 so i think the best compromise that i have seen um so i watch uh the game apologist a guy called nick uh ends up doing a lot of sonic content um his best content is maybe his non-sonic content but his popular content that pays the bills is the sonic content right which um he, he's got on record as as being a frustration so in his discord server um he has set up like a private room for sonic frontiers spoilers and he's just sort of just had a very clear rule those of you who want to seek the spoilers out chat it you know any scrap of information get this whole feverish little whatever it is script at um, scratch that itch right this is where you do that mm. and for those of you who just don't want to know stay the hell out of that channel mm. um you know use the rest of the discord but just know that if you go in that room you are getting spoiled and it's your own damn fault yeah i don't know if there's something like that that twitter can do because a lot of uh, even going back to the days of PPB forums in like the early 2000s, where everyone had really um, audacious, you know, forum signatures that they'd done in Photoshop, where they just threw every filter on it. Mm. Um, they had spoiler tags. So I think it was you did a, a double line before you typed the spoiler in a double line after. Um, no, no, back in I PPP days, it was um, square bracket spoiler, write it out square bracket backslash spoiler Mm. and it would just you had to click on it to reveal the text yeah even if twitter implemented something as basic and simple as that that's actually a really good idea yeah that would totally work because it's still the people that are um getting that sense of oh i know something hey mm. hey universe i found out this cool thing this is what the cool thing is they can still have that moment um, but without actually literally spoiling it for everyone. So everyone can go, okay, that yeah. person knows that piece of information. Uh, yeah, 
that could work so, really well. So, uh, you know, as, Elon Musk. As, <laughs> oh, he owns it now. If you're, yeah. if you're a listener of the podcast, then can you implement that? That would uh, that would be great. So before the comments come for me, I believe you can do it with images on Twitter, or at the very Sensitive least, there's content. a um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you have to click the image for it to then reveal whatever the sensitive content is. Mm. To my knowledge, and I may get corrected on this, at the time of recording, you cannot do that for text. You can only do that for images. But this is it as well. Like, people, So we have the technology and the wherewithal to prevent spoilers by just writing on it like doing a photoshop picture or something but not even not even prevent spoilers just contain it to those that want to know yeah can know can know and and have yeah. that discussion and and have fun together and yeah. fine they can enjoy that and those of us who are grumpy old bastards that don't want to know mm. cannot know <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 this kind of reminds me of a an idea i had for social media um platform and it's kind of like a bit dystopian but it could be an interesting top. It could be like an interesting uh, like experiment where like the rule is it's like the most um, severe monitored social media platform where no one can be negative in any way, shape or form to anyone else about anything. People can only be positive, encouraging, outgoing. Um, and, and that's that, that's like the rule. And then just like that to sounds see a bit, how would that work? Uh, it's not reality in any way, shape, or form, and it's a it's but just to be like as like a counter uh, social media platform to what's happening now. Uh, sounds a bit dystopian and an echo chamber. It's a bit what 1984, I, isn't it? Really, comic reviews and for a time, game reviews had this problem where people would not put out a negative review. Mm. Because uh, they didn't want to get blacklisted, yeah. essentially. They didn't want to stop getting their free copies. And particularly in indie comics, there was this long period of, if you haven't got anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Hmm. Um, but the problem is, as a creative, sometimes that... If someone says, oh, I loved your work, it was brilliant. Cool, thank you, that's a nice ego stroke. Hmm. I can do nothing with that information other than feel good for a moment. If someone comes to me and they're like, yeah, I liked the work. There was a lettering issue here where uh, the person on the right spoke first when it's supposed to usually be the person on the left. That caused me to read the balloons in the wrong order and it was disruptive to my reading experience. What they're saying is negative. They're saying I screwed up. Yeah. But I need to know that. That's something I can go, okay, thank you. I can not make that screw up again. You know, I can grow from that. I can evolve from that. So I think maybe there's a distinction between constructive feedback and negativity for yeah. the sake of negativity. Yeah. But yeah. certainly this, we're only going to to boost each other and and stink of roses is uh, too far to, to an extreme. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. Um, but yeah, it's such a shame that these spoilers come out and... Uh... The team did such a good job by the sounds of it, just from what I've heard in terms of like working on a cool thing in a cool way with some cool people. Sounds like a really cool experience for them. It's the best word I can think of to use. It's so cool. It's so cool. <laughs> I'm just jealous. Um, and to have what you've molded from the word go, and you can't have that experience playing it, to like have to mm. know that that experience is being spoiled to some degree to some players yeah. is a real shame. Um. So sort it out, idiots. Don't spoil things. On the topic of our habits changing, uh, our third piece of news, like that little segue down. I, was like, I love that. Touch. Steam have hit a new record for concurrent players online: thirty million forty nine thousand two hundred and sixty four simultaneous players. Uh, is the number we have here. Although there is a that is in dispute. There is also a figure of thirty million. 44,046 simultaneous players. Either way is a record, um, and either way is damn impressive. Hmm. There is a caveat. Uh, 8.9 million of those people were actively in a game at the time. The rest were, like, browsing the store or otherwise logged in. Yeah, or but, chatting uh, away or, or whatever. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think but because of all the other previous records have been um, counted in that way, it's just a bit of a 
you know yeah. it's not like yeah it's not like people were playing games 30 million people were playing games they were like active in the in the software right i guess um so yeah some of the games that contributed to that was counter strike global offensive where over 1.05 million players uh dota 2 don't even know what that is seven dota 2 it's uh moba uh over seven hundred and fifty thousand players PUBG Battlegrounds with 440,000 players, Apex Legends and Lost Ark round out the top five. Um, one of the things I noticed on this thing I'm reading here uh, is that Cyberpunk's revival boosted those figures as well. So it's when people all came clambering back onto Cyberpunk to play that, it got those boosted up. So it's a bit of a yeah. few factors. Well, Cyberpunk Boost was interesting. I know I've already tied anime into this once, mm. and Vinny's already going to be angry with me about that. This is a game but, podcast. Uh, yeah, just keep that yeah. in mind. And we're straight um, into vi- to movies as well, so he's going to be very upset uh, with you. Oh, no, not Vinny's wrath. I've never experienced that before. Um, but no, it's... <laughs> the Cyberpunk Edge Runners anime hit Netflix and did very, very well. Hmm. And that generated a lot more interest in the game on all platforms. Yeah. It also helps that the next-gen version is out now, you know, PS5, Xbox Series. Yeah. And um, that the patches to fix all of the launch issues are out. The game has had one hell of a glow-up and a revival. Yeah. It, it's seemingly done a No Man's Sky. And yeah. gone from a laughing stock to the thing everyone wants to play. Yeah. That seems yeah. to be like, uh, yeah, this is the second time this has happened. So No Man's Sky was the first time that's kind of happened on that scale. And now this has mm. happened again with um, with Cyberpunk. And it's ad- and it's interesting that a lot of people are going to Steam to play Cyberpunk. Um, so it seems to be quite, a, it seems to be like the the Steam game for people that also have consoles. I bet most of the people that are playing cyberpunk on steam also have a console where they just wanted to play it on their pc because it's not like a pc centric game from what i've heard i'm not sure about that on the basis that when playstation studios started bringing across you know god of war spider-man etc um they said we're not cannibalizing our own sales on consoles and they reassured shareholders that look the people who are playing on pc they're a different crowd to the people who are playing on playstation yeah when there's very few people in the audience, according to their market research, who have and use both. Hmm. Um, but what we are seeing is obviously Steam is a digital distribution platform. Mm-hmm. And PC's been that way for a while. Uh, consoles, we're now regularly getting reports that you know, 70-80% of A-game sales are the digital version rather than the physical version. Mm. Um, we are seeing changes in how we obtain and interact with our games. You know, Game Pass have just said we're below target for subscribers, but we still have over 25 million Game Pass subscribers. Um, That's like a huge Chris, amount. How do you play your games currently? Yeah, at the minute I'm using Game Pass. Yeah, that's 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 what I'm using. Um, uh, or PS Now, depending on what the actual game is that I want to be playing. But mostly it's through Game Pass, uh, and I hardly buy... Th- physical copies of games it's only a few triple a games a year i'd probably um shell out for um yeah yeah that's how i'm doing it. all about yourself um so i'm i'm sort of becoming more of a, a pc convert i try to keep my pc mainly for game development and video editing mm. um because that already takes up a lot of hard drive space and a lot of system resources oh yes um that said, I used to be staunchly physical only, and I used to be one of those who's like, I can still go to my shelf now and pick down my childhood copy of Sonic 2 and put that cartridge in a Mega Drive and it just plays. I can see that behind uh, you, yeah. Ever of the audio listeners, Sam is sat surrounded by physical copies of games, so there's some truth to that. <laughs> yeah. Um however, since really the PlayStation 4 generation, that started to shift in the uh, you know, I get the disc, I put the disc in, that downloads a day one patch yeah, from a server. Which I hate. Right? I hate that. Yeah. So much. I hate it. But the preservation act aspect is gone. And on PS3, I was like, yeah, there might be a day one update, but at least the game still runs from the disc, so I don't have to worry about hard drive space. Hmm. PS4, you put a physical disc in, 
and because of the slow read write speeds of a Blu-ray, it just installs to the hard drive anyway, and then the game runs from the hard drive. At that point, your disc is just a physical access key for a digital product. Yeah. And one day, when those servers are gone, that disc is a glorified coaster. Mm. You know, we had uh, Spyro Reignited on the PS4. Uh, the first printing of that game, later printings fixed it before the comments get at me, the first printing only had Spyro 1 on the disc. You put it in, and it started a download for Spyros 2 and 3. And obviously this is all terrible for people with slow internet connections, or who live in potentially uh, less affluent countries, or, or don't have access um, to the internet, but everyone assumes that you're always online. Mm. Um, you know, we had Virgin Media the the other day saying, oh, you might get interruptions to your services while we do upgrade works in your area. And I sat here like, half my games I can't play because of the DRM involved. I can't watch Netflix. Um, even Photoshop was like, no, I'm not going to open. I can't verify that you have an active subscription right now. It's like, do one. <laughs> Please just it's believe just... me. Right? But yeah. everything's so dependent on that one connection coming in. Mm. It's... But knowing that, and having staunchly been... I'll, I'll get tired of the sound of my own voice in a moment, I promise. Um, having been staunchly physical only in the past, I have PlayStation Plus Premium. Um, and I am, you know, downloading Deathloop instead of going out and buying it. Mm. Um, and I have Game Pass, and thank you for the Plague Tale recommendation last week. Um, but again, I'm not going out and buying Plague Tale. I'm like, oh, I'll yeah. grab that from, from, from Game, Game Pass. Pass. Yeah, yeah. Sonic Frontiers I have pre-ordered digitally rather than going out and getting a physical copy because it is the PS4, PS5 cross-buy on the digital, mm -hmm. and my son really wants to play it. So he can play it in the next room on the PS4 on that TV while I play the PS5 version in here on that TV. Mm. And for, for buying it once, two of us get to play it at the same time. Mm. Um, I, I think I've been converted. That and these shelves are, have pretty much filled up. Now I'm running out of physical space. So. <laughs> but the, the worst part, I I started buying digital copies of games I already own on disc when they've gone on sale, like Dead Rising 1. I've got a disc copy on PS4. Mm -hmm. Went down to £4.79 in the PSN sale. I paid £4.79 because I am now conditioned to be too lazy to get out of the seat, walk over to the shelf, get Dead Rising and put the disc in. Wow. It's just like, I'll pay £4 so I don't have to do that again. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. When it, when the game gets yeah. so cheap that it can... And it'd be quicker and more convenient if it's just on the hard drive. Because there's a, so there's, there's that other other way to look at it. Like, if game, well, yeah, if hard drive capacity keeps increasing and we can buy a box mm. that's just got stupid amounts of space on it, then... Yep it's going to be easier for us to just digitally download in the background onto our box. That could be like the interim, couldn't it? Until everything's totally cloud. Well, I had a, um, I've got a four terabyte external hard drive in my PS5 hmm. and that's got all of my PS4 games on it. So that the limited PS5 storage can just be the PS5 games, which can only run from that storage. Yeah. But it means that the last time I went to visit my hometown, I took that 4 terabyte hard drive with me and I plugged it into my friend who I was saying with, I plugged it into their PlayStation 4 and just all of my games were there mm. on this tiny little box. Like, And we're talking 200 odd games and sort to that hard drive. And all I had to do was sign into my account um, for the DRM to activate and allow us to play them. Mm. And it's like, imagine how your entire PS4 collection in a little box. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. You know. Yeah. What a world we're living in, eh? Um, but yeah, coming back to Steam and stuff, I guess it's like a <laughs> testament. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, you're right. Um, I think it's testament to where we are going with uh, technology and games. Mm. And it seems to be like Steam as a service and cloud and is, is hitting that niche that wasn't like didn't really exist because Steam's been around for donkey's years, right? But it's now getting, it's getting bigger and bigger. So it it's filling a part of a market that wasn't there before by the sounds of it because people have known about steam and known what it's about um but there's must be a reason why it's getting bigger and bigger 
Um, I guess it's because it serves most of the indie game dev space. And also now, you know, like with what you said, where, you know, Spider-Man and stuff is coming over to Steam, it's, it's seeming like uh, the streaming software packages. Like Channel 4, keep uh, Channel 4 have got, you know, 4OD, 4 on demand. And they keep going, it's the UK's biggest free streaming platform. And you think, wow, that's pretty impressive. And that seems to be tapping into what people want now. People want the largest mm. strap, you know, platform for things. And so, like, if I want to watch TV, 4OD is the biggest free one. So that's kind of impressive. Um, so yeah. that might be what's happening with games and Steam. It's like, Steam is huge. Like, there's so much on Steam. Um, so that so could yeah, be part yeah. of it. There are a couple of things that have attracted me to Steam, even as someone with a, an extensive console library. Uh, the first being that there are games going back a fair ways on there. So if I want to play, say, Star Wars The Force Unleashed or Batman Arkham Origins, right? I can technically pop either of those discs into my PlayStation 3. Um, and actually through PlayStation Plus, I believe both of them are on there for streaming. Um I can have, you know, a relatively decent 720p 30 frames per second experience on console. Or I can go get the Steam versions, um, which bear in mind, you know, all the console stores closing down and such, not going to be the case. I'm not going to be able to go back and necessarily grab myself a copy of it in the future. Mm. Steam, still there, mm. fine. Download it and run it on my current specs and actually have options for 4K resolutions and 60 frames per second and not the stuff that I didn't used to care about. Um, and I'm kind of upset that I now do. Um, we also have the pricing for Steam, wherein the Steam sales just destroy my wallet. Um, and on the flip side, I'm finding the more I go into these streaming services like PlayStation Plus Premium, like Game Pass, I'm actually trying and playing games that I might not have invested in or taken a, taken a chance on otherwise. You look at something like Tinykin and it's like, no, I would have never bought that. Yeah. But if I'm paying for Game Pass anyway, mm. and it's on Game Pass anyway, like It Takes Two, despite it being an award-winning game, I don't think I'd have ever bought it. But I co-opt that um, with Richie, again, another mention for him, why not? Um, why don't you just marry him? I know. Um, get a room <laughs> this weekend we did anyway <laughs> it just happened to be my room but I, I, I lost you completely lost you lost yeah so you wouldn't, it have takes... played, you wouldn't have played it takes two if it hadn't been yeah. free on the game pass yeah exactly and we co-opt that together yeah. uh, fantastic game I would have massively missed out had it not been on game pass mm. And even gaming nights with friends. Like, we're able to say, okay, who has Game Pass? Oh, all of us. Brilliant. Uh, so, Golf with Your Friends is on the table because it's oh. on there. Worms is on the table because it's on there. We know we all have access to Rainbow Six Siege because it's on there. It makes those very easy to organize because in the past we've sat down, like, even during COVID and lockdown, going, okay, guys, what are we going to play tonight? Uh, has everyone got Halo The Master Chief Collection? Oh, shit, sorry, mate, no. Mm. Uh, let's see what it's going for on CD keys, see if we can quickly get you it. You mm, know. Yeah. None of that. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so streaming is, is yeah, so uh, on-demand servicing and Steam fills that gap with uh, just having a massive, humongous library, and so there's going to be, it's going to be an easy platform for people to play together. Yep, I like that. That makes sense. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I guess that's, that's a good place. Um, what what have you been playing, Sam? Um, what what have you been up to? So you, you like my recommendation of Plague's Tale Requiem? Yeah, yeah. So I've not played much more than about five ten minutes at this point. Yeah. But um, I am like, oh, okay, I can see where this might show me what some of the new hardware can do. That's yeah. Um, mostly this weekend has been uh sega arcade games that got ported to consoles so uh played a lot of uh ghost squad which is a basically a light gun game in the vein of time crisis and such uh very good available on the wii go get it um 
played a lot of play through Die Hard Arcade. That's a ritual. Every time Richie's here, we I play love, through Die Hard Arcade. I love Die Hard Arcade. Is that the one with like one, two, and three, where three is the taxi game and two is the shoot? The... No, no, oh, no. You're thinking of Die Hard Trilogy. I am thinking of Die Hard Trilogy. Yes. Yeah. What, what's the, that? What's that Die Hard? Die Hard Arcade is basically uh, imagine Streets of Rage but 3D and with a Die Hard license slapped on it. I, that sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah, it's a great time. Um, we also played Confidential Mission, which is another Sega light gun game, came out for the uh, Dreamcast after being on the Naomi Arcade board. And that is, again, like Time Crisis Virtua Cop, but you're a, a James Bond ripoff. Hmm. Um, it's very cheesy and boo movie and fun. And the the other one worth mentioning in that group is Zombie Revenge. Yeah. Um, so that is basically the people who made Die Hard Arcade and its sequel, Dynamite Cop. Um, Dynamite Cop. Dynamite Cop, yeah. So, uh, which itself is amazing. Okay. They basically collaborated with the people who made House of the Dead to make a Die Hard Arcade game in the House of the Dead universe. Ah. Yeah. That sounds cool. That sounds cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, I've been playing... But yeah, Plague's Tale Requiem. I'm a few more hours in. Uh, yeah, really enjoying it. It's it's getting to be one of my favorite like triple A games ever. So it's doing a really good nice. job. Um, uh, yeah, set pieces and the puzzles are more engaging, which are again it's just, like impressive considering you think that they've rinsed it with the first game. So yeah, really really happy about that. Um, and they deal with the whole losing all your equipment and then re-remembering how to make your equipment and all this sort of stuff, like between the first game and a second game. So you know how in first games it's like, say like with um, Horizon Zero Dawn, by the end of the first game, you've got everything. You've got like all the spears and you've got all the ammo and you've got all the bows, got all the equipment you need to take down like a freaking apocalypse. And then at the beginning of the second game, you lose all your stuff. And in yeah. and in um, in Horizon Forbidden West, she just goes, "Oh yeah, I had an accident. And I lost all my stuff." It's just like a voice note as to explain that, and it's just like, ugh, no. It's like how Samus has a new power suit with none of the powers at the start of each game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But with Plague's Tale Requiem, it's inbuilt, it's embedded in the game, and like the back and forth between the people is like, "Don't you remember how we made this thing?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, of course." So it's been a bit, it's been a while since I made it. Uh, and then the pe- th- we need to find the ingredients. You know, we didn't have any. We had ingredients back then, but now we don't. And it, like it fits in with the game and the narrative. Mm. Um, and also, like at one point, she forgets her sling, and it fits in with the narrative of the game. So she's running away. She doesn't have a, having a sling, and it's it's part of the game. You know, like even if it's, if it's cutscene, it's still it's still been shown. Uh, it's it's yeah. been shown, and and it's not been told. It's not like off scene. It's like I have forgotten my sling. That's not a. That's not a line in the game, so it, it's doing a lot of um, a lot of things that are pet peeves to me. Right, it's doing them really well. I think you should have a side hustle as a voice actor. Well, I... that was a perfect delivery of "I have forgotten <laughs> my sling." Oh no! I'll put that in the uh, I'll put that in the intro. <laughs> I have forgotten my sling. <laughs> and oh dear! We'll get the views racked up. Like, who's this voice of an angel? Um, what we need him in um, Plague's Tale 3. Uh, this current predicament <laughs> appears to be suboptimal. <laughs> I can't remember what we did in the first game. Can you explain it again? <laughs> Might you recall? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you remember? In Plague's Tale 1, we did this. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> Excuse me, my good sir. <laughs> they're very British. Well, they should, they're French, uh, so they should be saying, Mon Dieu. Um, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've been playing that and Psychonauts too. Um, been playing that, really good, really fun, oh. really good, good fun. Um, I really like the visual elements. I love the combination of three D and two D. Um, really pops. It's like, it's like, it's like sweets for your brain. It's bright and colourful and cheery and um, just like interesting to look at. Like none of it's boring. Even just walking down a corridor or something worth catching your eye. So it's very stimulating. Yeah, very, very stimulating. My my six year old loves it, so we've been playing that together. I need to get some hours in on it actually, because he's only allowed a few minutes at a time these days. Um ah. 
But uh, yeah, so I need to get some more hours on that, which I'm I'm planning to do. Maybe maybe tonight, depending on how uh, editing goes. But yes, um, that's probably a good place to uh, to leave this this week. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we have a uh, video on YouTube. We'll have um, audio versions. We upload to Anchor, so it's on Apple and Spotify and all good podcast services. Uh, Vin probably, well, actually, I haven't spoken to you about Sam. It might be a few weeks until uh, Vin's back with us, um, possibly even over a month. We, who knows? So, okay. um, yeah, things are being pushed back uh there um but yeah hope you have a good week join us another time and maybe we'll have uh, an, indie, an indie game dev episode soon where i figure out how to change between screen sharing we'll, we'll give that a go but yeah uh until until uh next week then cheerio okay. where can oh. where can people find you in the meantime good Good save, Sam. Uh, so you can save me. You can see me. Uh, uh, I'm a critic. You can save oh, me. Oh, you can uh. save me. Oh my god. Sorry. Oh dear. Oh dear. Okay, it's been a it's been a long week. Um, I'm on Twitter, Acrylic Pixel. Uh, YouTube, Acrylic Pixel. Uh, I've got Patreon for my indie game Focus Find, which is like Focus Find or Acrylic Pixel. You can wish list my indie game Focus Find on Steam. Uh, and I think those are the main ones. Uh, what about you, Sam? Where can we find you? You've got you've got a few YouTube channels, haven't you? Uh, so the one YouTube channel, but three Twitters. Um, so my YouTube stuff is on at Webster's YouTube. That's it. Uh, my artwork, if you can call it that, is on at Webster's Art, and my game development is on at Webster's Game Dev. Um, of the three, the at Webster's YouTube is the most active because I still use that as sort of like my my personal account as well. Yeah, um, yeah, that's probably where I got that that confusion. Um, so on that lovely ending to a podcast, I think it's now safe that we can say goodbye. Is that right? Oh yeah, yeah, you're good now. Okay. You've you've ticked off everything on my list. Yeah. Phew. Okay. Well, on that note, have a good evening or morning, and see you next week. Bye bye. Ta-ra! <laughs> Just give me a second clap, why not?